All right, thanks everyone for coming. I think we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> that's on. Yeah, that's on. <laughs> so, th thanks everyone. Uh, what, what I will be doing, I'm, I'm Andrew Woods from Duraspace, and along with uh, Rosalind Metz from uh, Emory and Simeon Warner from Cornell, we will be introducing the Oxford Common File Layout Initiative. Um, and hopefully, in the process, we will be conveying the value and importance of having a specified layout for preservation persistence. So it, it's a, a, possibly a little more technical than some of the, the discussions that have been happening, but I think it represents a, a real opportunity for long-term savings for institutions, having a, a, a sane organization of your digital content um, and, and, and ultimately uh, providing long-term stability for a part of the mission that we as memory institutions are responsible for. So, when it comes to digital preservation, there is maybe a little bit of a gray area um, in, in terms of are we doing enough? So f let's say, for example, at um, a given institution, uh, for, from a digital preservation perspective, I, I do the things I should be doing, right? I, I have regular backups, maybe that's nightly, maybe that's weekly. I also back up my database. I uh, have multiple copies of my content, and, and that content is distributed in di different geographic regions uh, with different technology stacks, and either my, my cloud provider or my file, file system, it, it does fixed checking for me. Great. Uh, is, is that sufficient? Um, m maybe from a disaster recovery perspective, from a digital pr preservation perspective, mm, maybe there's a, an open question there. But taking it a step further, let's say that I am very diligent about implementing the, the guidelines provided by uh, the NDSA levels of preservation, and I additionally make sure that my content has access controls uh, that say no given person has right access to all of the content, uh, that, that I maintain logs somewhere of, of who is uh, acting on the content and, and when, what are they doing. I, I collect all the necessary metadata, the descriptive, the, t the technical, the preservation metadata. I have documented uh, format types for my, for my master copies. So I, I, I do all this. And, and on top of that, I'm very interested in the, the, uh, the OAIS model, and I, and I try to have my architecture informed by that. But all of that, I, I still have certain concerns. Uh, am, am I actually doing enough? And so talking a little bit about those concerns, just on, on the continuum, say for example, I come across one of my digital objects that seems to be broken. Or, or worse yet, maybe one of, one of our users communicates that one of uh, the objects that they were expecting is broken. The, the question is, what, what recourse do I have? What can I do about it? Uh, do, do I have to restore from the state of my, my preservation repository from last night or from a week ago? Can I actually look on disk and see what might be wrong? Is, is there anything for me actually to look at there? Or moving down the continuum, uh, let's say that we've decided not to use a particular application anymore for our preservation repository. Uh, we want to move to a different application, and that, that, well, I guess the question is, does that mean I need to migrate my 7.3 petabytes of data because I'm using a new application? Do I need to move and reshuffle my content just because we're, we're making an ap application choice, and well, I have to do that all over again the next time we make a, a new application choice? And maybe further down the continuum, and I would like to think, or I would hope, that this is a worst case scenario where maybe you can envision sort of the, the smell of burning tires and <laughs> looking around what was buildings is sort of a pile of concrete and rebar, basically just uh, surrounded by a smoldering wasteland. But off in the distance, you see 
an arm bursting through the rubble, <laughs> and, and, and I have the hard drive. And, th and this, is, this is the hard drive that contains the content of my preservation repository. And, and the question is, if, if I have that hard drive, is it in and of itself complete and meaningful? Can, can, I, can I plug it into a, a POSIX server with, with basic tools, actually inspect it and, and rebuild civilization? It is, is enough information there in an intelligible way? Or do I need some, some special application that is just not available? So what, what this suggests is that there is uh, a, an element that's missing. And, and, and I would like to think that we are just at the phase now where uh, you, that, that this is becoming more crystal clear. And I, and I would like to think that this is actually relatively self-evident. So there, there is an opportunity or a need for having a simple and, and maybe like self-evidently simple, non-proprietary, specified, open standards approach to the layout of our preservation persistence. And, and ideally, this, this specified layout represents the bedrock of how, how our content lives and, and then all of the applications, which are actually much more transient than our content, all the applications can be built against that specification and then next year we throw that away because there's something shinier that is then built against uh, that specification. So, so the, this represents the, the yeah, the, the bedrock for our content, and it also opens up the door for working within a community, which is something we've heard about, work, working within a community that is building tools uh, that also work against the, that uh, same content. So, uh, giving a little bit of background, uh, these same types of conversations arose in the fall of 2017 at an, an unrelated uh, meeting at Oxford where uh, many digital preservationists were talking about, well, th um, this among other things, and one of the outcomes of that meeting was a, an articulation of this, the state of this issue by Andrew Hankinson at, at Oxford, and that, that uh, document was posted to the PASIG mailing list, and after some back and forth on the PASIG mailing list, a couple of months later, uh, the first community meeting, uh, which was recorded, so you can uh, look forward to that if you weren't there, um, was, well, there, there was this community meeting that involved over 30 institutions where the conversation was furthered, uh, use cases were gathered, and ultimately, uh, more or less a year later, after monthly recorded community meetings and weekly editorial meetings, uh, we have produced two iterations of a specification for the Oxford Common File Layout, and I will invite Rosalind to uh, describe those. So the Oxford Common File Layout is actually um, two documents. Um, if you go to ocfl.io, uh, you'll see that we have both a specification and implementation notes. The specification itself describe objects at rest. So what one expects to see should they just come upon an object laid out according to OCFL. Um, this specification discusses primarily the objects. Um, that includes the structure of the objects and the inventory um, which um, inventories the objects. One thing to note that OCFL does not make any um, statements about what should be contained within your objects, only that a, an object should include both the file and the metadata, whatever that file and metadata is at your own institution. We do not try to um, push a um, common object model onto institutions. Um, the specification also discusses the storage route and how objects would be laid out um, together. And we also provide in um, the specification examples to help illustrate the use of OCFL. In the implementation notes, um, we outline best practices for the objects in motion um, and provide advice for implementing the specification. Um, this includes guidance on digital preservation, 
Um, key recommendations for keeping within the spirit of OCFL. We had many, many conversations and have become very close because of them around some of these conversations. Um, storage, uh, that includes how content should be stored and how um, objects should be handled as they move back and forth um, within the storage. And then uh, client behavior, so expectations for what you might see if you look at um, a client that would lay OCFL out within a storage infrastructure. So some of the benefits of OCFL are completeness, parsability, robustness, versioning, um, and storage diversity. And I'll go a little bit more in depth into each of these. Um, so first, completeness. Um, the complete intellectual object is stored together with its metadata, as I mentioned. Again, we do not provide or prescribe what that metadata is or even what those files are. We leave those up to the institution. Um, it does fall in line with um, existing standards like TDR, um, the NDSA levels of preservation, OIS, um, but it's important to note that these um, specifications, while they provide the foundation of much of what we do for repositories, do lack um, exact prescriptive methods for doing this. And this is something that OCFL makes up for. Um, it also allows for the ease of mapping from one system to another, and that's something that you'll see um, as we talk about all of those benefits. One benefit, too, is parsability. Um, so in disaster recovery situations, we want to make sure that humans can be able to read and understand the, the content itself. Um, and that can be Andrew's hand coming up from the rubble, but also you have um, failure of your repository. Your repository ceases to exist for whatever reason. Um, so we wanted to make sure that humans could read it. Additionally, we wanted to make sure that machines could read it, um, and that would allow for, again, disaster recovery situations. You can place a simple, machine, a simple application on top and read through an OCFL storage route, um, again, without a lot of effort, conceivably. Um, the benefits of um, OCFL are also its robustness. So we have strong fixity built into the specification um, and talk about it within the implementation notes as well. Um, one of the things that you'll see on, I believe, the next slide is uh, we do keep um, uh, hashes um, to address the content within OCFL. Um, those can be used for fixity checking, um, but they can also be used um, just to identify files. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how uh, storage, uh, this can also help uh, reduce your storage um, capacity or how much storage you need. Um, content can be easily validated using the inventory. Um, and this was something specifically built in. We wanted to make sure every single time you're making changes that you can validate your content. Um, and objects can be completely self-contained. So you can keep an object all in one place, um, or if you want, you may be able to reference other places as well. Um, Versioning, I would say, is probably the piece of this specification that most people find interesting. Um, so changes to the object are tracked over time. Um, we use forward delta to reduce the amount of content stored. So this is something I referenced in the previous slide. So using forward delta means that multiple copies of the file do not need to be stored um, over and over again. A lot of uh, folks who do use versioning often will version the entire object and will keep files, uh, duplicates of files from one version to the, the next. And this is something that OCFL nods to um, Moab, one of its um, predecessors um, that was developed at Stanford um, for. Um, 
Previous versions of the objects can be reconstructed using the inventory.json file. So you can go into the inventory file and actually reconstruct um, a previous version of the object should you need to. Again, this was something that um, Moab did very well, and we um, tried to keep in the spirit of that by making um, some improvements on Moab. You'll see off to the side um, a copy of the inventory.json file, um, and uh, you'll notice truncated um, uh, hashes. Uh, we used SHA-512, um, and they're really long, so hence the truncating for um, examples. Um, one of the last um, benefits is storage diversity. So this is designed to work with various storage infrastructures, including object storage, which are prevalent in cloud offerings. Um, multiple institutions have a need to use um, that were part of the editorial group, but also part of the community, have a need to um, use storage um, that is offered by Amazon in particular. Um, it will also support the conventional file system metaphor, so you'll see that conventional file system metaphor used throughout. Um, a lot of that is really because humans think, or most of the humans in our industry think that way. Um, so we, we kept, um, kept that sort of metaphor as we talked. Um, and as I mentioned, and ag once again, um, it can be implemented to ensure deduplication of content. This could over overall lower your storage costs, especially if you are in a cloud environment. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Simeon, who's going to talk about the status of OCFL moving forward. Yeah, it's my pleasure to say a few words about uh, where we are and where we're going. So Andrew noted earlier that the first draft of a specification and some implementation notes was released in October of last year. Since then, we've had some really great community feedback and we're closing in on a beta. You can track that if you want through our GitHub repository and the issues tagged as to be resolved before beta and we hope to get there in the next couple of months, partly because we have an open repository presentation and it would be great to have it out for, for that. So one of the ideas of a beta release is to allow a period of stability uh, with something that we think is a, a plausible candidate and have that stability allow for implementation and testing work. People have already started playing with the specifications as they are, so Perhaps the most robust work so far is from John Hopkins. Um, there's a client in the Go language, which is, is pretty robust. Um, also in the Go language, there's work from Oxford associated with the Oxford Research Archive, and they're focusing on both creating a client and an underlying API that can be reused. There's some experimental work from UW-Madison using Java. The specification uses examples and there is some work on some test fixtures based on a reference, reference implementation we've been working on at Cornell. Um, Stanford have aspirations of doing work within their Stanford digital repository in Ruby perhaps this summer, or at least Julian's hopeful, maybe he has to persuade John, Tom. <laughs> um, and the Fedora community has been looking at OCFL as the underpinning for persistence in archival systems as part of the Fedora 6. Next slide. I get to say that. But wait, there's more. So I had, I had designs on giving you lots of crazy pictures of what might be possible, but my more level-headed <laughs> companions said, no, Simeon, I uh, will let you put up a few words and then you have to speak <laughs> a little bit about what might happen in the future. So we've purposefully really quite controlled the scope of version one to a set of features which we were pretty certain the majority of the people engaged in our community wanted and needed and that we felt we could specify with reasonable certainty that we weren't doing it a bad way. However, we have an interesting set of use cases in one of the GitHub repositories under OCFL, and these cover things like, what about a packaged up object? So if you have objects that have many small files, 
They are both inefficient to store and hard to fixity check if they're all individual. So what about a tar or zip file for a whole object? What rules would be necessary to understand the presence of such an object in a storage route with other sorts of objects? How would such an object be updated? Another option might be, I want to package up each version's content. This has the same benefit of the previous option in that you don't have lots and lots of small files, but it also has the benefit of maintaining the immutability of any individual version once it's written. But once again, what are the rules around that? How would that complexify access, checking, and updates? What if an OCFL object could be stored with different versions in different object routes? Or what if some of the content of an OCFL object were referenced in other systems? How could we handle that in a way that would still give some sensible notions of validation, completeness, um, replication? So one of the things about OCFL is it's this blindingly simple arrangement of files and collections of files in the structure to have a set of objects. So obviously you can do replication by simple file system operations. But as soon as you start doing this, you start saying, well, how do I know my copies are in sync? Am I doing it efficiently? Am I copying just the new things? So are there ways we should think about additionally specified aspects that would help a system maintain replicas and help have shared tooling around that? Um, OCFL is sufficiently close to some existing approaches, noticeably, notably Moab, that in place migration might be a possibility. And you can observe that there is no way to instantly migrate 300 terabytes of content. In fact, any way to migrate 300 terabytes of content is going to be kind of painful. Um, are there ways which we could help manage a gradual migration um, and support ongoing understanding of good state during that process? Up until a few years ago, SHA-1 was a good checksum. It's already not a good checksum. SHA-512 is currently a good checksum. Um, even with standard advances in computing, that will no longer be the case some years hence. If we suddenly get good quantum computers, all bets are off, so there'll be changes. Um, we have an extensible mechanism built in, but how, from a specification point of view, would we manage what's the set of checksums that common tooling to, should support? And then there's the, the open slot for your community needs here. The idea is that we're building a specification and hopefully a community that will build tooling around a set of shared needs. Um, so far, we've had a certain number of people engage with us, and perhaps there are other opportunities that we don't yet know. So now we've convinced you that this is potentially interesting stuff, what should you do? Well, if you want to watch, the first place to watch is the community list. There's a link there to the groups. Obviously, these slides will be available. Um, that's pretty low traffic. It announces meetings. It shares notes from meetings. And that's a, a good way to watch. There's also the OCFL.io website, which has the current releases and drafts and links into the GitHub. If you want to get involved a little more heavily, Andrew already mentioned the monthly calls, uh, which are announced on that list. He also noted that they're recorded, so if you happen to miss one, it's easy to catch up. We have a fairly low volume Slack channel. Um, everything that we're doing is within the OCFL organization on GitHub. Um, we'd certainly love to hear of new use cases or comments on existing ones. And then, of course, there's a current draft implementation notes. We'd love review discussion issues. And if you're really gung-ho, Implement it. I think with that, we have time for questions. <laughs>